On today's show, the New York Knicks have the most to figure out this season going into the first couple months of the year. The Timberwolves are right behind them. What do they have to figure out? We'll talk about that and more on today's Locked On NBA. Let's go. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, you're locked on to the NBA. My name is Nick Engstead, host of the Locked On Mavericks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show, making Locked On NBA your first listen today. Well, the best way you can help us grow this show is to listen every day on any podcast platform, like the video on YouTube, and comment anything below. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. Place a $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And joining me, here on a Thursday from Locked On Bucks, what you got for me, Camille Davis? Man, just still trying to figure out my shot on NBA 2K, Nick. It's been almost uh, <laughs> a few weeks. Trying to get still, green? Still trying to get that green down. <laughs> they change it up every year on you and they make you and learn a new it shot. It's more difficult. It's so difficult this year. You know what? You know who also says that? Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons has, <laughs> has the same feeling, but, but IRL. Right, at least mine is you know virtual, <laughs> virtual only. They, they, they keep changing the mechanics on this every. every he keeps <laughs> complaining about it. Today's episode, we'll talk about. Uh, I guess we'll talk about his former team a little bit here. We're going to talk about the teams that have the most to figure out early in the season. So like preseason. First month of the season, who's got the most to figure out going into the beginning of the year? I want to talk about a couple teams out west. Camille's got a team out east that we'll get into, and then of course. We'll play Count It Up, where we count out the most interesting, fun things in the NBA, including uh, Giannis. Giannis, yeah. can we just, can we have one day of peace, Giannis? Can, can we? Can we? <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Knicks. Are they grifting or are they, are, are you with it? Are you, are the Knicks grifting it? We'll talk about that with the trade that they just pulled off. And uh, we'll start with the Knicks and the trade that they just pulled off. One of the teams that you picked yeah. That has to figure out the most early in the season is the New York Knicks. Why? Well, let me tell you something out of experience from covering the Bucks here. When you make a trade right before training camp kicks off, uh, <laughs> building that chemistry can be kind of tricky quickly. Like, they got some things working in their favor, like Cat has familiarity with tips and everything like that. But it can mm. be difficult to integrate a new player that quickly right when camp is getting ready to start. That's reason. There's a few reasons, but I'm going to start there because – Got some lived experience with that one. It's a lot to figure out when, especially he's coming in as a starting center and he played, right? Because right? I'm assuming he's he's going to start there. Well, I, mean, I don't know if we've we've learned that yet, but he was playing next to Gobert for most of the time. I have a couple numbers. We're going to talk about the Timberwolves. They have some stuff to figure out later, but he played a lot with uh, either either Gobert or Nas Reed. He did not play a ton by himself last year. He played like 200 possessions by himself last year. He's been a center in the past, but now they're going to put him in this role. Mitchell Robinson's not going to be ready to come back. And right. so, I don't know, they're not going to start Jericho Sims or Precious Achua next to him, I don't think. They're going to go with those wings. And so now, yeah, they have a ton to figure out with their offense, with adding a whole new piece, plus Mikael Bridges to try and figure out too. Yeah. Like even yeah. just... Not, don't even consider just the cat trade. They still have to figure out how to integrate him. They have to figure out, uh, they lost Isaiah Hartenstein. And so that was yep. a big piece. He was a big glue piece for them last year. Like there's just a bunch of moving parts. And so I'm with you. It's not like they changed coaches. Like I thought about doing the Lakers for this because right. you, know, you always think about it's right there. You always yeah, think about Lakers for, like like with, with the new coach, but they're almost like the opposite. We're like, all right, we have a bunch of new players, but we have the same coach, same star, same all this, but it is a ton of different pieces to figure out early. It's a lot of pieces to figure out, and it's also how do those pieces fit together? Like, Cat is going, I think the offensive fit with him in New York fits beautifully. I love the offensive fit, but I have some questions mm. defensively, especially with the Coach Tibetho team. Like, we know how he gets down about his defense, so he's going to be leaning really heavy on those wing defenders to do some things. And Tib said he even thinks OG can guard fives, which... I don't know about that in big doses, but if that's the way you're going to go to try to cover up Cat, then then good luck. And you mentioned that Tibbs has played with Towns before. I'm yeah. going to look at their numbers, but I don't remember them being like super great defensively when he had Towns at, at center back when when Tibbs was was the coach there. Uh, and there was also some so personality I, clashes as well uh, with Cat and Tibbs as well. I know Cat said like you know that's past, we're good now, so on and so forth, but. You know, it was it was some they, tension there before. 
they were the 26th, 23rd, and 24th ranked defense when Tibbs was there with the Timberwolves. Now, there was a different different level of talent, for sure. You didn't have OG and Anobi and Mikhail Bridges as your defensive wings. Right. Like, you did not have that. But it is interesting that, that now they're going to be reunited, and that's something to figure out. You mentioned that there has been some tension between the two of them. There was some of that. And so they have to figure that out. They have to figure out uh, the offense. I think, like you said, it's going to be easy with the spacing that the town's going to bring Jalen Brunson is it's like back going back to playing with Porzingis, right? When he played right. in Dallas, it's, it's back with that five out spacing. And I think that's going to be awesome for him, but the defense and the scrappiness that made the Knicks what they were last season, when they beat the Sixers in the playoffs, like that team is kind of completely different now. Yeah. It's going to look different this year in the garden. It could still be really fun with the offensive firepower, but it's going to look different just like it's going to look different in Minnesota this year, which is another, I know a team that you wanted to call out as a team to watch over those first few months, because uh, the changes they're going to have to make with Randall there, mm, it's going to be interesting seeing that fit too. This one is wild to me. So the Timberwolves, uh, Chris Finch comes out and says that he's going to start Julius Randle at the four. Makes sense. They're going to go Gobert, right. Julius Randle, Jaden McDaniels, Anthony Edwards, Mike Conley. The spacing there is just not as great. For all the good mm -hmm. things we said about the spacing for the Knicks, you could say the opposite about the Timberwolves because right. Randle is a he, – he he takes threes, right? Like, But he's not a, a great three-point shooter. He's definitely not the spacer that, that Towns is. Just a different type of player overall. And I think they're really going to have to figure out their offense with this group because because Randall's just a different offensive player than Cat. Yeah, he absolutely is. But one thing that I do like about that move is the Dante DiVincenzo fit in Minnesota mm. there. Like, it gives a little bit of insurance as well with Mike Conley getting older. I know he's a point guard. Dante's a shooting guard for the most part. But just having another guard in the rotation, it's going to be really help. You can play Dante on the wing as well. But again, you're integrating players who are going to be playing – presumably big minutes um, in a very short period of time since the trade was just made official, I think on Wednesday. So like it's, it's going to take some time for them to get it going. So I don't know how Randall's fit is going to be offensively for the team defensively. I mean, he can give you a little bit more, but the Timberwolves are also going to have to lean a bit more on Nas Reed. It feels like and at least it gives them an opportunity yes. to play some more. Yeah. They're going to lean on him a lot, which they paid him last year. And we kind of all looked right. and said, all right, is this, how are they going to keep all these bigs? They had their like three of their four highest paid players are going to be centers <laughs> at, at a certain point down the road. And so now you know, Chris Finch also commented on that. He said, it's extremely important to recognize this is not a money deal. This deal in totality checks a lot of boxes. I'm not hundred percent mm -hmm. sure which boxes it. <laughs> oh, you're, so we play during count it up. We usually do cap. So it's zero to five caps. How many caps would you give Chris Finch on that quote? There's at least four caps on that one. Like financials definitely <laughs> played a reason. There's no way you're blowing this team up after they just had this historic run to the Western Conference Finals the year after. They lost in just, five games. Look, like ain't no way. I'm not. I'm not believing that. That's 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 cap on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay, so the difference between Cat and Randall. I went to Synergy and I started to pull up just what kinds of offense because you you think about them and you think about Cat as this, this spot up guy and Randall as this like you know, ball in his hands type guy on offense. The biggest differences I found post-ups cat posted up about 14% of his offense and he ranked very good on synergy was really good in the post-up Randall 16% of his offense. So a little bit more of his offense than than cat, but he was below average at it. So they they're changing in the, in the post that changes a little bit of what the Timberwolves can do on offense. They don't have that guy to dump down in the post as effectively as cat was last year. Right. And the other difference was as a roller. Cat was excellent. It ranked excellent as a roller last year, and Randall ranked poor as a roller. So it takes two different angles of your offense out of, out of commission. Uh, Randall's a little bit better in transition, which I think is something that, that's going to help them, um, and maybe a little bit better on isolation, but not that much more. So, it, But it, it changes a couple of things that they can do on offense, and I don't know how this checks boxes for them. Dante DiVincenzo checks boxes because they needed to add depth, but I don't know if the Randall-Cat swap does. Yeah, me either. I mean, again, that's why I'm like, there's some cap on the financial tip of that because we know Randall has a player <laughs> option next year. Like, and the amount that he's making is 30 mil uh, during the player option. He's 33 this year. And Kat's contract was going to be a whopper for the, the Timberwolves to pay. So there's some cap on that. There's definitely some financial <laughs> incentive there. But for the on court fit, they're looking to build around what Anthony Edwards can bring to the table. This is Ant's team for sure, for sure. There's no question about it. I yeah. mean, some would say there was no question last year when you watched them, but there is really 
no question now. So it'll be curious, too, to see what this team looks like officially going through Ant. It'll be interesting to see how they handle both of these moves on the Knicks side, on the Timberwolves side. Go listen to Locked On Knicks and Locked On Timberwolves to hear their perspectives on it. They got great stuff all throughout these trades. Coming up, the Clippers have got to figure out something early or else it's going to all fall apart. The Suns, maybe the same story. We'll talk about that and more coming up. Count it up. Today's episode of Locked On NBA is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook has all kinds of props and odds and things that you can use to get in on the action. If you're an NFL fan, I know, Camille, you're a Packers fan, and I know you're watching your Packers. You can get a big return early with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So if you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, play-by-play, all kinds of stuff there. And when you place a $5 bet, your first one, you get $200 in bonus bets. I'm looking at the NBA regular season specials right now. Tell me if you would take any of these or if you even like consider taking any of these. Any player in the NBA to score 82 plus points in the regular season. That's plus 4,200. Ooh, I like the odds. Maybe I'll throw a little bit of money on that. Okay, throw throw a little on there. Any player to record 15 made threes in the regular season game. That's plus 2,500. No, I'm not doing that one. Clay's going to do it. I'm calling it. Uh... (laughs) Any player to score 30 points or record 30 rebounds. 30 points well, and 30 re- Who would even do that? Well, Andre Drummond, according MB, to him, he Jokic. can get the rebound part of it, but the, the <laughs> point, I don't know. Check out all those and more at FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com. See what's available for you. Check it all the time. FanDuel.com. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Locked On NBA. Being in every day, you're listening every day. We have a daily show that covers your team, like Locked On Bucks with Camille and Justin, Locked On Mavs with myself and Isaac Harris. Check the link in the description that covers your team every day. All right, Camille, we're talking about the teams in the NBA that have the most to figure out early in the season. Obviously, the Knicks, Timberwolves, they make a trade right up into the deadline right. to start the season. They've got a lot to figure out. The next team that I think has a lot to figure out early, I'm going to make the case for you here. The Clippers. A lot of people are down on the Clippers. I'm one of them. I don't think that they're going to be a very good team next season. But I think they could be potentially a good a good team. They've just got to figure it out early, and they've got to hit the ground running early with this team. Are they a playoff team? Are they not? They lose Paul George. They've got to figure out how to play without Paul George. They have Kawhi Leonard, who says he's feeling a lot better than he was with his, you know, his knee. He doesn't play in the Olympics. They've got to figure out that, the load management with him this year. And then... Are they going back to Harden ball? Is that what they decide to do? Because James Harden sure thinks that they are. Uh, do you think that this Clippers team is anywhere close to a playoff team? Or could they potentially, is there a playoff team in there somewhere? To say no, I feel like would be not giving them enough credit. <laughs> right? You hear how, right? You hear how she, she breathed in right there? She gotta, was like. Gotta oh. try to head, gotta try to figure <laughs> out how to say it exactly. But I mean, the West is tough. The West is tough, Man. right? The Clippers won 51 games last year, and that was good enough for the four seed in the West. This year, they lose mm. Paul George, who was also a great insurance policy to have when Kawhi wasn't available, because at least you can count on having two stars on the court at all times. But this year, I know Kawhi has already said, like, hey, we're working on the knee, we're figuring it out, something we're going to have to manage. But I wouldn't want to rest on that alone. And then you have James Harden talking about, well, I know one thing is going to be a lot of me this year. And um, <laughs> look, it's there. Like if J- if you believe that James Harden, the Houston James Harden is somewhere still wrapped up in this Clippers version, then I can see the optimism. Me personally, <laughs> I think the Clippers are going to be fighting for a playing spot. <laughs> That's where I think that they're going to be. But I also think that they could be not because there are like 10 teams that are better than them in the West, I think, to start to start the year. The James Harden quote you mentioned, he said, it's definitely going to involve a lot of me. There was talk when I was in Houston. You can't win like that. You just saw a guy, Luka Doncic, last season make the finals playing the same exact way that I played. I know he's not a system player. He's a system player. But mm-hmm. like, I think those days of James Harden are gone. We I saw it. First hand, I was there for those, you know, Clippers playoff games, watching the Mavs and, and Clippers. And he had some moments where he got to the rim. The Mavs also, their defense let him get to the rim a little bit because they just funneled everybody into the middle. And so it I don't know that that James Harden is there. He did play really well last season, though. But I think for them, they've got a lot to figure out with some new pieces, lack of depth, some just some weird. Yeah. I mean, you bring a Kevin Porter Jr. back, you've got uh, Bones Highland still on the roster. Like you've got some of these these pieces to try and fill in some of these gaps 
that Paul George and others have left. And yeah, I think they just got a lot to figure out. And if they don't figure it out early, like it could really, the losses could really ramp up for them. And all of a sudden they dug themselves a hole they can't get out of. Quickly. And that's the thing about the Western Conference. As you mentioned, like you said, there's about probably 10 teams <laughs> that you can argue that are better than the Clippers. So if you get off to a slow start while you're trying to figure things out, it is going to be hard to make up that ground. You do not want to spot other teams wins in the West in particular mm. and try to catch up as it goes on. Like I know last season, the Clippers were able to go on a really amazing win streak when Kawhi was healthy and hooping and, you know, they were on the, the roll, but I don't see that in this Clipper squad this year. It, it just doesn't feel like they have enough pieces. So for them, if they are going to try to make some noise, they're going to have to count on, I think getting off to a pretty quick start this year. They also have a new arena. I don't know how much they have to dope. figure out with that, but you like you're with it. You like it? I'm with it. I love. I I want to go to LA <laughs> just to go to a Clippers game to experience that <laughs> arena, the arena of bathrooms. I'm so, ha- I'm so happy for our locked on Clippers host Darian Vaziri because he is a real Clippers fan. Really loves the Clippers. I went to you know when I went to what was it game one? I guess his voice was shot after the game because he was just screaming the whole time, and he finally has a building that he can go to. That is, and actually, the fan shop that they can go to, like that part, I was super yeah. excited for him about. They actually have Clippers merch there, and not just like tied with the Lakers stuff somewhere. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Clippers have a lot to figure out. Yeah, this season, especially early. Yeah, they do. And I wanted to say real quick, uh, not only do they not have to share their shop, it doesn't have to be like a little bit of their things and mostly like Laker stuff in there. Like they're going to have their own yeah. building. So that's cool. I just don't know how much winning's going to happen in that building this year. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to see <laughs> how much is going to happen. And is it, what is it? Is it the footprint center? Where are the, where are the suns play? I think that's what they play. And how much is going to happen in the suns arena this year? Well, listen, they got a new coach this year as well. Mike Budenholzer, who I am very, mm. very familiar with. I think he is a floor right. raiser when it comes to coaching, but I think the suns are going to have a lot to figure out this year as well, pretty quickly, but at least now they're going to have a point guard. So Tyus Jones mm. is coming in. He's going to be able to free up what Devin Booker has going on, what Bradley Bill has going on, what KD has going on. And also knowing Mike Budenholzer, that means they're going to be a lot of threes being shot. So it's going to be interesting to see the shot diet for the Suns, given the fact, one, they have prolific mid-range players with KD, with Book, and also they have a big who isn't really known for shooting those threes, but he's been in the gym. Nurk's been in the gym. So he's going to try to get them up. <laughs> No. Listen, you're 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 I mean, you're okay. putting your face in your hands, but listen, I'm, I'm, I'm listen, shaking my head Bud over here. here I... The Bucks still had John Henson. He had John Henson shooting threes. <laughs> John Henson. Just bring up John Henson on here. Nurkic shot. Let's see. He shot 93s last year. He made 22 of them. That's 24. percent Year before that, for Portland, he shot 119 in 52 games. That's a lot. And and yeah. uh, 36. 36% of them. So it's like, okay, he's done it in the past. But, yeah, the the Suns, they, they've been trying to get him to shoot threes forever. And they, they got to figure out something offensively. But they were good offensively last year. So I don't know that, yeah. like, coming in and trying to change the offense is really what this team needs. They're going to probably start Tyus Jones and, and Beal and Booker and KD and Nurkic. And they're going to have to try and put together an NBA defense around them. I think that's what they've got to figure out more so. And then – is Royce O'Neal and Akogi, are they, they're definitely part of their better defensive lineups. How often do they have to go to them to close or to, you know, in certain stretches of the game? That's what I think what they got to figure out is how do we balance the defense a little bit more with the offense? That is going to be great. I'm, I'm with you that, that, that Tyus Jones is going to help them be a lot better. The Bud's going to raise the floor for them. Yeah, I definitely agree with that as well. And then, too, you think about with the addition of Jones, what that does to who they were starting last year. Like, now you have Grayson Allen coming off your bench, who I'm presuming is going to be like a six-man for them. I saw Grayson Allen said he put on, like, 20 pounds of muscle this offseason just trying to be strong and ready to <laughs> – Listen, he said that he has found that when he is stronger, he feels like he's healthier. So he's been hitting the weights a lot more. He's trying to get better defensively. So he said adding on the pounds should help him this upcoming season. So – Allen is someone who also is familiar with playing with Mike Budenholzer, so he kind of understands what's going to be asked of him, his role. But hearing that he put on all that weight was a was a shocker to me. But again, he's trying to do his role, do his job well. Uh, Grayson Allen is never going to be somebody who you're like, all defensive. But 
if he can just move his feet and be a system defender uh, with what Bud is cooking up there, like they have to get somewhat better. Like they, they have to like the defense, not good enough last year. You know what that just says to me that Grayson Allen put on all that weight, just what? every opponent of the Suns, just watch your faces, you know, just, just, you know, just when you're around Grayson Allen, just be careful, you know, just, it's going to hurt worse this year. Let me tell you, you're around Grayson Allen. <laughs> He might hit you in the That's face. true. That is true. That's a good point. That's a good point. There you go. Those are some teams we think have the most to figure out early in the season. Coming up, let's play Count It Up, where we count out the most interesting, fun things in the NBA, including Giannis doing too much and the Knicks grifting again. We'll talk about that and more coming up. Big chicken, baby. Zion Williams. And porn stuff. Take that for that. Count it up. 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 All right, Camille, let's count it up. We're counting the most interesting, fun things in the NBA, starting with your guy, Giannis. He was asked about becoming a married man this summer. He finally settled down, and uh, he answered the question. He said, you asked what my favorite part of the wedding was. My wedding night after the wedding. That was my favorite part. We've we've seen these. We've heard these quotes from Giannis before. My question is for you. How many days should we put Giannis in horny jail for this? Oh, man. He's a fan. He's a fan. He's a fan. Um, Listen, I think for this one, this infraction, um, he can probably do about a weekend. So let's give let's give him a long weekend. Let's give him three days. Let's give him three days. Yeah, like a Labor like Day three, weekend. Yeah. yeah, for being a little freaky frog. Let's three days for being a freaky frog. Uh, the bell thing that he had that was a week. That was that was a a, a week, a month. Like you gotta go. Yeah, I'm with the. the this is like the a three day like, weekend. It is, he was so on just, Instagram just with oysters. Like he is always like he takes that, <laughs> that 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 Greek freak nickname very very seriously. Like he staying freaky. Yes, like the T-shirt says. <laughs> Oh, Giannis. I'm still I'm thinking back to Giannis live on Instagram going through the drive through after the title to like get those nuggets. Yes. And I'm just surprised he didn't say anything worse in that whole live stream. Like, yeah, like Giannis unfiltered for that long with no sleep like that. He was PG that whole time. He was probably so exhausted and his knee was probably still hurting that he couldn't <laughs> even think about that. He was just yeah, trying to right. get some food and nourishment at that point. <laughs> Let me get some nuggets. Uh, Fred Katz, alumni, locked on alumni, by the way, Fred Katz, reported that the Knicks have disclosed a new loophole in the CBA with the Randall Towns trade. Teams in their situation, meaning that they're above the second apron and have too much, too much cap on their hands, cannot aggregate minimum salaries anymore. So in sign and trades of guys, Jeffries, Browns, and Washington, they're paying each of those guys a dollar above the minimum, the veteran minimum. So they are not minimum guys. So they can aggregate them in trades. League sources tell the athletic. My question is, Count it up. are you with it? Or did the Knicks just grift it again? Both things can be true. Okay, so they definitely mm. gripped it, but I'm also here for it. I've been looking for the ways that these teams are going to try to get around this new CBA and the restrictions within it and seeing they just do prices right. Like, we're going to go $1 over, and it's going to be cool. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I like the, the creativity that they showed here. It's one of those where you're just like, oh, I hate it, but yeah, like like good on you guys to try and figure out how to do that, to sign and trade these guys for a dollar and a dollar too, not like a thousand, not like, you know, 500,000 or just a thousand, hundred thousand over. They could have done a cent, I guess, too, but just a dollar, like you said, price is right rules. Oh, sadly, I'm with it. I'm with it. See, I get you it. Got They've to, had you got to admire the griff sometimes. Like the hustle was there. I do. I, admire. I do. It worked. The trade worked out for them, and I think they got better because of it. Yep, yep, I do too. And other uh, teams are going to be like, ah, we'll do it next. <laughs> they'll they'll probably go. Do, yeah, they'll probably go do it now too. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Anthony Towns, speaking of the Knicks Timberwolves trade, found out about the trade at the Timberwolves facility. He was putting up shots, and he was working out when he found out about the trade. My question is: Count it up. Should teams have to give players a bigger heads up on trades like this? Mm, that's a tricky one because again, that's something that Drew Holiday mentioned when he was traded from the Milwaukee Bucks that mm. he just wishes that he right. would have gotten some type of heads up. And I understand how about quick. how about Harrison how about Harrison Barnes who got traded in the middle of a game sitting on the mm. bench one time for the yeah. Mavericks? <laughs> yeah, someone comes out like, "Hey, excuse you, um, let's go in the back, please." <laughs> like, 
I, yeah. I feel like I wish there was a way to give the players some more notice, but I'm not sure how much notice they could actually realistically give in those situations, especially when deals are coming together really quick. And because these are reported that, you know, we don't have Woj anymore. Wow. I just said, we don't have Woj anymore. It's not like he's That's dead. That's so crazy. He, he's <laughs> but, but we have the Shamses of the world and the Chris Haynes of the world and the Steins of the world. They report these details before it even goes to the league office. So before it's even like agreed upon, and so I don't know that they can do that anymore because in, you know, in the old, like the old days, back when you had to report these in like the newspaper or like a website or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, you could, you did probably have that time to let a player know and to do all that. But now the details are leaked and the details are, are made public before everything even gets settled. I mean, we have the, the whole, remember the, the Brooks Brooks trade where they traded the wrong <laughs> Brooks, like. You remember that one from a while ago? Like, yes. The details of that were leaking before they even knew which players that they were sending back and forth to each other. Like, we, I don't think we have time to do this anymore. So I would love for these players to have more time and more heads up because Towns, he gets drafted by that team. He mm -hmm. like uh, becomes an adult on that team. He goes through a bunch of iterations. The Jimmy Butler saga, yeah. Anthony Edwards comes in and he becomes a number two and like really embraces that role and does a good job there. Gobert comes in and now all of a sudden he's got to figure out how to play with him there. He did a lot for that community, that organization. And all of a sudden he gets traded just like that. I mean, it is wild how this business works sometimes. So I, I felt for Towns. I felt for Towns and in all his multiple voices, I felt for Towns. <laughs> You got to acknowledge the multiple voices. I wonder which voice he had when he he heard. That's not important. Not I got traded, about <laughs> and I got traded, and it was like, what are we even doing? I'm going to the Knicks. <laughs> Listen, I can't wait for 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 Knicks fans to experience Cronthony <laughs> Towns like the New York media, <laughs> Knicks fans. Like oh, I already saw God. people like, don't bring that soft stuff to the garden. Like we we yeah. ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> the two things I'm excited about this season are the first thing. So the Knicks with, with Towns, the first time something happens there. And then the first time Paul George messes up really bad in Philly and goes on his podcast the next day and has to like talk about it. That That's going to be an interesting one for sure on oh, that one. Players having podcasts adds a different dynamic to things because it's like, how are you going to really <laughs> respond to this tomorrow on your show? We know the show is coming. So are you going to dodge it? You going to own up to it? Well, that's already been cleared now because Draymond Green talked about punching Jordan Poole in the face during practice. So th there's nothing else that can be done, I don't think, that can that is like, oh, well, I won't share this on a podcast. You know, like that's already been breached at this point. You know what? Last You're one for right. you. <laughs> Last one for you. You mentioned it. Andre Drummond said that he's the best rebounder to ever play the game. Same thing. Count it up. Zero to five caps. How many do you give him? Oh boy, when you in the league with Wilt Chamberlain before you, um, I'm gonna go ahead and give that four caps. Like, I know we didn't have all the footage when Wilt was playing, but like, there are numbers that Wilt put up where you're just like, how is this even realistic? And you can argue the competition, <laughs> so on and so forth. I get it, but the numbers are still there. So <laughs> I don't, I don't see Andre out here grabbing fifty boards or anything like that. He's a great rebounder, no disrespect to that, but like, all time, I don't know, buddy. I have to go down pretty far to see where Drummond is on the all-time list. I mean, he's not even listed on here. Uh, Will Chamberlain averaged twenty-four point eight or twenty-four point four rebounds per game. Bill Russell twenty-four point eight rebounds per game. You're not going to touch those guys. And yes, they're in a different era of the league and, and all that. They didn't have a three-point line. There's all kinds of different reasons why um, Will Chamberlain was jumping over guys at the time, right. but. 24 rebounds. How many times has Drummond had 24 rebounds ever in a game? These guys averaged it. I'm, I'm calling, I'm, I'm good. I'm giving them all five caps on that. <laughs> you know, I saw, I saw a number. I don't have the statistic here, but it was some like percentage of rebounds on the court where Drummond ranked really high. And I was like, okay, y'all, y'all had to dig for it that way. Not the, the per game numbers or anything <laughs> like that. You guys had to kind of dig to find it, but I respect the hustle. That's why I gave it four caps, not five. <laughs> Total rebound percentage, Andre Drummond, 25.1%, and that, that leads. But I don't think they have – it's total rebound percentage since 1970. So it doesn't even count Bill, like Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. They would have – I bet that, that would have been even higher. So, yeah. So there, four caps feels right to me because, sure, since the 70s, your rebound rate, thumbs up, Andre. Thumbs up. Like, you 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 be, <laughs> you be snatching them boards. But, like, Wilt, come on, man. Like, the legends of the game, I'm not seeing it. Also, he's a seven-footer. 
Dennis Rodman, his rebound percentage was 23.4. And Dennis Rodman was not a seven footer. To me, I think he's the best rebounder pound for you go pound per pound. And I, I think he is as far as just like who is a technical best rebounder ever. It's probably Dennis Rodman. Yeah, I would see that I can get on board with, especially after seeing the last dance and he's talking about how he studied uh misses to see the angles of how the rebounds are gonna come off. I was just like, dude, you broke this down to a science, <laughs> a sweet science of rebounding. Dennis Rodden's rebound like rebounds per game are wild. 18.7, 18.3, 17.3, 16.8. Four, like, these are like scoring percentages for a player. <laughs> absolutely, in, absolutely insane on that. Yeah. Let us know in the comment section which team early on has to figure out the most for their team. Go listen to Locked On Bucks. Go listen to Locked On Mavs. We've got great stuff. What are you and Justin talking about on Locked On Bucks this week? We've been talking about some media day things and how the Bucks are responding to it. Reports from early training camp days, as well as uh, how the rest of the league is shaping up and if we should have any more fear uh, as for the Bucks with how the East is shaping up. See if the, you should fear the deer or if the deer should fear over on Locked on Bucks. Uh, Locked on Mavs, we just had interviews. We had interviews with Clay Thompson and Kyrie. Go check them out on the YouTube channel. Guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us on Locked on NBA. Subscribe to the show. Follow us. Listen uh, every single day. Great stuff tomorrow coming from Wes Goldberg. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Locked on 